Catherine McBanawa is a former club bottle girl from South Florida, but now she is spending the rest of her life in prison. That's because she was convicted of helping to coordinate the murder of a law professor in Tallahassee, Dan Markell. Also convicted, the father of her children, Sigfredo Garcia and his friend, Latin King gang member Luis Rivera. All three are locked up in prison for their roles in this murder-for-hire plot. So, why would a bottle girl from South Florida want to help arrange the murder of a law professor who lived more than 400 miles away from her in Tallahassee? Prosecutors say it's because of her boyfriend, a man named Charlie Adelson. Charlie's sister, Wendy, was going through a bitter custody battle with Dan and wanted her children to move to South Florida closer to her own family. And prosecutors say Charlie convinced Catherine to get her ex, Sigfredo, to murder Dan. So far, only three people have been convicted, and now it's time for Charlie Adelson to face a jury charged with setting this entire murder-for-hire plot into motion. Tonight, we speak with someone who's been waiting since 2014 for this trial. Dan's mom, Ruth Markell, joins us live for the whole hour to tell the story of her son Dan and her quest for justice. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And as we get ready to talk about this story out of Tallahassee, Florida and South Florida, I want to talk about another criminal, actually two other criminals. You may know their names. I know them very well, not personally, but their names, their stories. John Gotti and Sammy the Bull Gravano. What, who are they? What do they have to do with anything tonight, right? Well, Sammy the Bull was a hitman. He was John Gotti's right-hand man. John Gotti wanted someone dead. He would tell Sammy the Bull, Sammy would take care of it. And finally, when the U.S. attorneys got their claws on these two, who did they want? Did they want the guy who was actually going out and killing everyone? Or the man who was setting it all in motion? The man who was ordering the hits? And for law enforcement, it was a no-brainer. John Gotti was a bigger fish. And that's why they gave a deal, some sort of a deal, to Sammy the Bull to get John Gotti. That's the way it works in murder for hire cases. The most important person to get is the one at the top. The one who, who hatched the entire idea, the plot, the plan. Now, let's get to the case we're talking about tonight. We begin with Sigfredo Garcia Luis Rivera. These are the hitmen like Sammy the Bull. They're the ones carrying out the actual physical murder of Dan Markell. They've been caught, they've been convicted. One pled guilty, the other went to trial and was convicted by a jury who figured it all out based on the evidence. Okay, got it. Catherine McBanawa, who is she in all of this? She's the broker. She's the one, I would call her a middleman, but she's more of a broker. She's brokering the deal between the person ordering the hit and the people who are gonna carry it out. She's right in the middle, right in the middle of all of it. She's been convicted. Now, let's get to the big fish, Charlie Adelson. Hasn't been tried yet, but has finally been charged. Finally been charged, he is the brother of Wendy Adelson. Wendy is the woman who was in this custody battle with Dan Markell. They had children together, they were married, but they split up and, and, and it, was, it got rough. It always gets rough in those situations. But this went beyond. And prosecutors say Charlie is the one, through Catherine, who gets the hitmen to carry out this plot to kill an innocent man. Now, for those of you who don't know all the details, because there's already been two trials, Court TV legal correspondent Julie Janae has more of the background for us tonight. To this day, do you think he's guilty? Yes, ma'am. Do you believe that he should be prosecuted for his involvement in the murder of Dan Markell? Yes, ma'am. 
That's Catherine McBanawa talking about her ex-boyfriend, Charles Adelson, during her murder trial for the death of Florida State law professor Dan Markell. Do you think he should come forward and let the jury know that you had nothing to do with this? Yes, ma'am. It was McBenawa's second trial for Markell's death after a jury deadlocked in her first trial in 2019. The second time around, a jury rejected her claims of innocence. The defendant is guilty of first degree murder. Now, Florida prosecutors are setting their sights on Charlie Adelson, Markell's former brother in law. What enemy or enemies had Mr. Markell made that set into motion such a brutal act? The answer, his own family. It would take eight years for prosecutors to bring a case against Adelson to a grand jury, despite early suspicions of his possible involvement. Markel was involved in a bitter child custody dispute with Adelson's sister, Wendy, when he was gunned down in his driveway in 2014. Wendy Adelson testified that there was ill will between her ex-husband and her brother. He had bought me a TV when I got divorced and said it was a present and made a, a very bad joke and bad taste that it was cheaper than hiring a hitman. But prosecutors say Adelson did hire hitmen with McBanawa's help. Sigfredo Garcia, the father of McBanawa's children, and Luis Rivera, a gang member and friend of Garcia's. Rivera pleaded guilty in exchange for testimony implicating Garcia as the gunman and McBanawa as the link to the Adelson family. I gave him the truth, bro. I'm not going to go back and forth with you. Man, I gave him the truth. Like it was Katie and Garcia. It was all three of us was involved. Investigators used a sprawling web of surveillance video, wiretaps, and cell tower data to connect a vehicle that was leaving the crime scene to Garcia and Rivera. Connecting McBanawa to the plot would prove more difficult because she wasn't involved, according to McBanawa's lawyers. It wasn't through Catherine McBanawa. This wasn't something that was negotiated through Catherine McBanawa. It was about her. The communications that we have between Sigfredo Garcia and Charles Adelson in the weeks before the murder, in the days before the murder, are consistent with the fact that the, there was a deal between the two of them, and part of that deal was Charles Adelson breaking up with Catherine so that Sigfredo could get back the woman that he loves so much. What's different now? Leon County prosecutors say they have a new version of secretly recorded video showing Meg Banawa and Adelson in a restaurant in 2016 with enhanced audio. Prosecutors showed the video to the jury in Meg Banawa's retrial and to the grand jury that indicted Charles Adelson. The piece of evidence was something that I did think was important, and I've always felt like if we could just get that clarified, that would make a big difference potentially in the case. So I was really happy to have that piece of evidence to present to the grand jury. Charles Adelson now faces the same charges that McBanawa was convicted of. First degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and solicitation to commit murder. Adelson has pleaded not guilty and maintains his innocence. Now, there was something in, in, in Julie's report, Julie's report, that I don't want you to miss. She said it took eight years, eight years to charge Charlie Adelson, the big fish in all of this. That's a long time. That's a long time. Think about the family that had to go through all of that and wait for that moment. And now there's going to be a trial, which you don't know what's going to happen at a trial. You don't know, they're very unpredictable. You see them on Court TV all the time. So let me bring in our very special guest tonight, joining us from Toronto, Ontario, the mother of the victim, Dan Markell, and the author of the book, The Unveiling, A Mother's Reflection on Murder, Grief, and Trial Life. Ruth Markell is with us. Ruth, thank you so much uh, for being here tonight. Um, let, let me start, I wanna start right with, with Dan. When I, say, when I say Dan Markell, what what is what do you think about what comes into your mind after you know i know you've been through so much you and your family but when you hear his name what are what are the the images the thoughts that you have first of all i want to thank you for inviting me i think it's i know you've been doing a lot of a lot of story time on the dan markel murder and i really appreciate it 
and uh, thank you again. To answer your question, when I think about Dan, I think about him today as a father. I think about all the time that he spent with his children and he only wanted to be in his ch with his children. He used to go to their daycare and in the mornings he would go in and have breakfast with them. And then after that, he would later on uh, pick them up and always take them to the park and do certain things. So for me, as much as he was acclaimed, very acclaimed lawyer and a scholar and so forth, for me, he was um, the thing that I loved most about him is how he grew into this exceptional father. That's so great to hear that that image is just etched in your mind. Uh, I'm so glad to hear that tonight. I, I want to kind of walk through so we have a better understanding of, of what really happened here. Um, can you tell us about this relationship? Like, where was Dan in life when he met Wendy? And how quickly did they fall in love, get married, and, and uh, start, start a family? Well, that's a, that's a good question. So Danny had uh, always wanted, we're Canadian, first of all. Danny always wanted to go to Harvard, Yale, or Princeton. And of course he did that. And he did the uh, very successful route of uh, people who finished Harvard, graduated law school, went into England, got another degree in government, did another year in Israel, came back to the States and finished law school. And then he clerked. And he went to Washington and it's his first job. And that was really um, the most important thing um, that he did at the time. He also started, I wanted to tell you one other thing about him. He started something called Prof's Blog, which made him very acclaimed. Prof's Blog is a blog for lawyers. Dan started that in 2005. And believe it or not, Facebook started at Harvard in 2004 but only came out public in 2006. So there was a lot of young people following Dan, and he was quite well known in the legal community with the law students and of course the uh, law professors. So he went to Washington, now we get introduced to Wendy, and Wendy is seven year, was seven years younger than Dan, and they, uh, they met because when Wendy was coming to Washington to do an internship, so she went to J-Date. J-Date is the Jewish dating service. And um, believe it or not, she already had her job. She was looking for a place to live. And her and her mother, Donna, selected Dan as the candidate for, for her to meet when she was in Washington. They went and they met in Washington after a little while. And uh, they later on decided that they were gonna get a little more serious and that's how the relationship started in Washington. That is fascinating that it was Donna, her mother, who was involved <laughs> in picking Dan. Dan. Wow. How quickly did they get married? What was the wedding like? And, and how much interaction you know, did you have with your new in-laws? Well, uh, we, they, 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 they got married, so they, they met uh, earlier on, and they got married in 2006. And, um, you know, the typical thing, so we're Canadian, and I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that, is we don't necessarily have, you know, the kids go out of town, and uh, all of a sudden they, they move on, they don't come home. It's more typical, generally speaking, uh, for a Canadian student to go to Canadian university and sometimes come back. However, Dan lived a totally American lifestyle. And of course, he was never coming back. He had already told us that before he left because he wanted to be in the States. But the point I really want to make is we didn't have that much time uh, to meet uh, Wendy. We had a few introductions to her. They were in, she had to finish law school. And I think that's the whole part of the story. So Dan and Wendy uh, met in Washington. They commuted back and forth for a little while. And then after that, uh, when they started to get serious, Dan started to realize, well, if he's going to get married, have, you know, get engaged, he better start to think about something uh, closer to Florida because she had so many years left to be in law school. And that was really how the relationship started for her to complete um, law school. And for him, he got a job as a, like as a, at the time as a uh, 
professor, well, was a professor right away, but um, at, at uh, FSU, Florida State University. And that's how the relationship really nourished itself. And they're together, they, they, they get married. Um, any initial impressions of, of the Adelson family uh, for you? Well, there were some initial dis dis uh, problems in uh, some parts of the wedding. Um, so I'll explain to you one issue which did continue later on. Uh, when Danny, as he got older, meaning in adolescence in university, he, he, it wasn't that he was religious as a Jewish person, but he had a very strong identity to want to preserve some of the Jewish culture and the sense of belonging and so forth. And one of the critical issues of participating in Jewish life is often to have a kosher home. And that means that you, you don't bring into the home uh, pork, bacon, ham, and so forth. And also not to have milk and meat uh, together. So this was part of Dan's value system before he got married. And of course, wanted his children uh, brought up in the, in the Jewish tradition. And so this was really the principles of which, you know, it's nice if a family has some values. And this is really how Danny wanted to start um, their life together. And they did meet on J date, right? So, I mean, it, that was sort of almost the, the foundation of the, of the relationship. So when they get, what happened though? Like, did, did, did you have any idea that there, were, there was trouble um, that, that there was going to be this breakup even after having the children and starting this family? Yes, the, the problem started to occur, not in the early parts of the marriage. They seemed to work out uh, some balance in the whole issues of, uh, I would call it just the practices of the Judaism. But what, what really started and really triggered a major event, let's call it, uh, was that when the children were born, they had an agreement between them that they would bring up the children kosher and they would be kosher with, we have a thing in the Jewish religion sometimes or practice. Some people are kosher outside, inside, and they tend to be a little more flexible outside. And Dan and Wendy had, a, had an agreement that they should be, um, children should be kosher both in the home and out of the home. And they did some very nice things, which was when the preschool was running and on, uh, both Wendy and Dan at the time brought in uh, tofu hot dogs instead of, you know, beef hot dogs that were not kosher. And also they brought in, um, you know, falafel and other product. Now, while they were doing that, here's where we start the problems. So Donna, the mother-in-law, decided and told, the, and told the nursery school that don't worry, you can give them the regular hot dogs. And so this changed the, uh, the situation and created the conflict for them to start to have some issues. Uh, it wasn't too pronounced in the earlier part, but then it continued to progress. It, to me, I, I'm still shocked because it was Donna, the, the, the Dan's mother, future mother-in-law who picked him out and got them together on J date, and now all of a sudden, raising a family in the in the in the faith and adhering to kosher meals becomes a, an issue and a problem. I'm 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 floored by this. So um, when the divorce takes place, right? The the, the they're splitting up. Um, was Dan? Did Dan know it was going to happen? Like, was he expecting this? Um, was, was there a battle to keep the, the, to give it a try, to keep, to keep the family together? Yeah, he, he certainly did, but he, well, let me go back a bit. A bit. So sure. Before, before the separation, and, and actually how the separation occurred is quite, is quite significant. So prior to um, them even having a separation, uh, they were in South Florida. Dan had gone away to teach in Israel for a month. And when he came back, the kids have had uh, shrimp and they had bacon and uh, this really created havoc. And at that point, um, I think that what the big difference was that Wendy might not have supported it as much as she could have 
and uh, prevented Donna from really changing uh, the lifestyle. So they went back to, they were in uh, Florida, South Florida, I should say, they're always in Florida, but South Florida where Wendy's uh, parents lived. And we actually visited that, that period of time in the Christmas season. And, um, and you could see that there was the beginning of some cracks because of the conflict. And anyway, they went back to um, Tallahassee in, uh, in uh, 2012, 2012. And at that time, you know, they, they knew that they had to do some marriage counseling and so forth. And as time progressed, I think that um, probably Wendy more than Dan at a certain point uh, really decided uh, that she wanted out. And Danny was in New York and um, they had come to Canada the month before the separation. And I knew already that there was a lot of tension, and so did Danny. But he never expected the, um, the separation um, the way it happened. So he was teaching in New York, and he came back to um, Tallahassee because Wendy called to tell him she wanted to be out of the marriage. And when he came home, we happened to be on the line with him. Half the house was, was emptied out. Um, the children were gone. The bedrooms uh, of the children were uh, their younger clothes were there, but not their clothes that fit them at that stage. And afterwards, um, when Danny walked downstairs, uh, there were divorce papers on the bed. So he called this his Pearl Harbor. And Wendy had already taken out um, half of the money in their, uh, in their joint investment account. So it was horrific for Danny. He never expected the bombshell like that. He knew there was issues and he would have wanted to maintain the family and want to resolve it and so forth. Ruth Markell, Dan Markell's mom, uh, with us uh, the entire hour. We're going to take a short break, but when we come back, we'll hear more about the separation and then the day, the day that the hitmen came to Tallahassee. Plus, coming up next hour. <laughs> In Delphi, Indiana, the man accused of murdering teenagers, Abby Williams and Libby German, is locked up but is not shutting up. Tonight, we take a look at a note he sent to the judge and try to figure out what it means for his upcoming double murder trial. I am begging to be provided with legal assistance in a public defender or whatever help is available. You want me to start? You just start at the beginning. Friend, family member, murderer. You never know what's real behind the scenes. He shot him between the eyes. No person should die like that. What are you doing? These are the stories of the victims killed by someone they knew. You can only handle so much before you snap. She's evil. You know, I'm your flesh from blood. Someone they knew with Tamron Hall. All day marathon. Beginning Friday morning, 9, 8 central. On we licensed everything. Did he mention hiring a hitman to kill your husband? Objection. Here's it. Overruled. No. Did he ever joke about he looked into hiring a hitman, but buying you a TV as a divorce present would be cheaper? He did make that joke. He tended to repeat himself, and sometimes he would make jokes that weren't very funny about all kinds of things. All right, and was that TV, did he buy you a TV as a divorce present? He did. But prosecutors say he also hired the hitman who killed her ex law professor Dan Markell, and Ruth Markell is with us, Dan's mom. Um, Ruth, l let me ask you this. The, the, the breakup and then the custody battle was all about those children. Um, how bad, intense did it get? Well, I want to clarify one thing. They didn't really have a custody battle because they had 50-50 in their arrangement, so it's not a custody battle as, you know, a traditional custody battle. The issue really, so we talked a little bit about uh, the kosher issue. The next big issue was that Donna and, and Wendy later on, they wanted to move from Tallahassee. That's the real issue. And um, what happened was, so their divorce actually was in 2013, 
But prior to that, um, they, Wendy, with Donna's assistance, uh, actually had a petition that was presented to the court in Tallahassee requesting that the family, meaning Wendy and the two boys, move to uh, South Florida. Their family was at Coral Springs at that time. And, um, and basically, that, they, that she, with the young children, would, would have the assistance of her grandparents, and Danny would stay behind in Tallahassee. Um, and that was really, that's the major issue. It's the geographic uh, mobility of leaving Tallahassee that's really uh, the next big factor in the actual divorce situation. And then the judge, this was the big part, the judge declined and told them that they cannot, tell, meaning Wendy and Donna, that they were unable to move. She did, she did not accept any part of the motion because they had a loving father involved and they both had jobs at Tallahassee University and at FSU. And the point I'm making here is that was a very clear message. And not only that, the judge actually said that they could never really reintroduce this issue again. So they had their backs, and particularly Donna, against the wall. And that's the issue. That, it's not a traditional custody issue. There was no custody battle. It was really a geographic location of where they could be moving. As you know, when there's two families, uh, the par two parents who were split, it's a question of how are you going to make the arrangements? And that's the issue. Absolutely. And for people not familiar with the geography of Florida, Tallahassee is like more than 400 miles away from South Florida. It's, it, it's not like you can just, you know, bop over there and just jump over to the next town. It's like going like three states away. So um, let's talk about the day um, that Dan was assassinated in his, in his driveway. Um, where were you? How did you find out? Actually, um, so I, we live in Toronto, the family, but I was in Montreal visiting. Um, we have an aged uncle who's really the father figure and the grandfather figure who was 97 years old in Montreal. And I was in Montreal visiting and uh, they couldn't get a hold of us. Dan was actually shot uh, 11 a.m. in the morning and we didn't get any notification until about 5 or 5.30. Uh, and, I, and, I, and then I got a call in Montreal. And then afterwards, um, the, uh, some of Dan's friends and others had called um, a rabbi. He was now in the hospital. He was shot. They already knew that there was hardly any chance of him surviving. And they uh, basically told me, they called me, the, the rabbi from Chabad, that's a Jewish organization, and Tallahassee called me along with the emergency doctor and uh and phil had already phil dan's father already knew about it and um and and what they told me was i'm scary as crazy that he probably won't make it and he would die uh about 1 a.m or 2 a.m which is exactly what happened so he was shot on july 18th and and died on uh, july 19th 2014 2014 Eight right. years ago. Right. So in the aftermath of all of that, um, what has it been like for you, this, this journey of eight years from that day to where we are now? I'm really glad you asked that question uh, because that's really, I did write a book. It's called The Unveiling, A Mother's, a mother's Reflection on Murder, grief and trial life. And the reason I wrote the book, and I'll tell you what my perception of all of the uh, issues related, this is a very glitzy case, a very glamorous case, as you know, and had a lot of publicity, but the victim is lost. And this is the purpose of the book. And also um, the victim is sometimes described as the orphan of the criminal system. So what the meaning of the unveiling is, which is the title of the book, in the Jewish tradition, after there's a funeral, we have a ceremony or a ritual 
where you put the, tombs, the tombstone on the grave site, and there's writing on the, on the tombstone, an inscription about the person, but we cover it with a piece of fabric until there is a ritual where everybody comes together for a service. Now, why this is so important, and I talk about the grief, I was very distraught before, like the eight months prior to this um, unveiling uh, ceremony and service, but my deep, deep grief started at that moment in time when I actually saw the tombstone covering the gravesite, the, the finality of it. And that's really where my personal grief story started. You know, the expression, it take a few nails, and the last few nails in the coffin, hit the coffin. My, the second purpose, which is more important, and really why I want to talk about it tonight, is to lift the curtain to the public and show the public what the family is going through, the whole experience of the victim experience. And this is critical because, you know, there's so many shootings in the States. We have plenty in Canada. A million people lost their lives in COVID, probably more now. And people are facing so much loss. But the criminal system experience for the victim is very different. And there's two descriptions of what the family is going through. One is, it's called, psych, one, is, one is called homicide survivors. And as homicide survivors, we're dealing with a sudden loss, final death. Now this is different from other trauma. It's, it's researched as different. That's one factor. The second factor is the whole experience about going through the criminal system and the fact that there's hearings, investigations, as you know, in this case, we've already had two trials, many hearings at the beginning. Now we just finished, as an example, Catherine McManawa was just convicted in May in 2022. In July 22, 2022, there was her sentencing. In, in September, there was the actual um, Arthur hearing for Charlie Adelson. So, our life doesn't stop, even although a trial is not happening. And as right now, Catherine McBanawa is actually having an appeal. So we, the victims, go through all this. It's a roller coaster lifestyle. And that's the reason I wrote the book, so the public can really see what is happening to the family. Absolutely. And, and you're, so, you're so right. It is the part of ours. And I, we try to... Um, keep that balance when we can, but the trials and everything, it's always so focused on the defendant, the defendant, the defendant. Ruth Markell is with us. She's staying with us. We have much more uh, to cover as we talk about the story of her son, Dan Markell, uh, and her search for justice. Don't go anywhere. Uh, State of Florida versus Sigfredo Garcia. We, the jury, find as follows as to count one, the defendant is guilty of first degree murder. We, the jury, find as follows as to count two, the defendant is guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder. We, the jury, find as follows as to count three, the defendant is not guilty. So say we all this 11th day of October 2019. 4 9 now. Take a look at the top line, right? We talk about the big fish all night long. You see Charlie Adelson, right? The third one. Next to him is Donna Adelson. We've been talking a lot about her tonight. Wendy Adelson, that's Dan's ex. And then all, all the way to the right is Donna's husband, Harvey Adelson. Um, Ruth Markell is still with us. Her son, Dan, was shot and killed by two hitmen uh, that prosecutors say were hired uh, by Charlie Adelson. Uh, Ruth, how would you describe your relationship, your interaction um, with the Adelson family uh, before Dan's murder and after Dan's murder? Well, bef before Dan's murder, so, so remember, it, it, we're not uh, geographically in the same country, never mind location. Uh, they lived in Tallahassee, and uh, Wendy's family lived in South Florida. So we did have... Uh, of course, we had several nice, very nice uh, occasions. Uh, so both are boys, the two children. Uh, the first one is the elder one's name is Benjamin, and the younger one's name is Lincoln. 
and uh, the tradition of a Jewish uh, boy's birth uh, after eight days, there is, you know, there is a ceremony called a bris, and we did see them then. We saw them. We would go every year, like many Canadians, to Florida. Uh, we would go pretty much Christmas time, and then we would see them again. But there wasn't like a, you know a highly interactive situation because if we went to visit Dan, they they the parents uh, Wendy and Don and Harvey were actually in South Florida, so we did see them. After the murder, I wanted very much, no matter what, to make sure that we had contact with uh, both Benjamin and Lincoln. And actually, um, we, we visited. I took my Canadian grandchildren, who are considerably or older uh, than Dan's boys, and we visited you know, several, many times during the year uh, in the first two years. And that was really uh, my attempt and their acceptance, Wendy, uh, to have the continuity of the relationship in that early period. We've, we've spoken a lot about Donna Adelson tonight. Um, very close with her daughter, Wendy, obviously, but um, it, it seems like she played a very important role in Wendy's life and the decisions. Um, what was Dan's relationship like with, with Donna? Well, I, th I think there were in the earlier years, it wasn't too difficult, but then it became very, very um, tense, particularly as Donna was instrumental in undermining Dan's uh, religious identity and had no respect for it. You know, she would even take the kids to McDonald's where they would have a hamburger with cheese. So that's another violation of the law. So there, there really became um, an undoing. Uh, started not even with the geographic issue, but the religious issue. And then, of course, the geographic issue accentuated when Donnie, Donna, I should say, really tried very hard uh, to get the kids to move to Florida, to South Florida, I always call it Florida, to Coral Springs area um, after the divorce. That, that became very, very, uh, very, very difficult. Ruth, when we come back, I want to talk about you, your grandkids, and how you change the laws in this country. Unbelievable. That's next, plus coming up next hour. In Tampa, Florida, Matthew Terry is facing the death penalty accused of stabbing his girlfriend to death after getting released from prison for stabbing another girlfriend who survived. Tonight, we are live from Tampa with the latest. Why did she die? Blood loss and her airway was also transacted. She couldn't breathe as well. In the more than eight years since Dan was brutally murdered, the Markell family has endured unfathomable grief and loss. Their only son was stolen from them, and members of the Adelson family have not allowed them to have a continuous and loving relationship with their grandchildren, Dan's two young boys. That's another big part of this story. Big, big part of this story. Ruth Markell is with us. Uh, the grandma to those two boys. Um, Ruth, so tell us what happened in, in, in trying to see your grandchildren and then what you did to change our laws here in the States. Well, what, ha what happened is um, after the, this is really an important part for me, an important issue. And for a lot of grandparents, grandparent alienation is a huge uh, social problem. But for me specifically, what happened is after the arrests, in uh, 2016, so it was after Garcia Rivera and later on Catherine McBanawa were arrested, um, Wendy decided that it was not a good situation uh, for us to be continuously visit. She had changed the boys' names in 2015, so that's a year before the arrests, and uh, she changed their names from Markel to Adelson at that point. And then after the arrests, um, I was very concerned and I wanted to make sure that the boys uh, would be safe 
and uh, never end up in the Department of uh, Family and Children's Services. Anyway, as a result, we were cut off and um, we tried very hard. Our lawyers uh, behind the scenes tried you know, to get us to be able to contact. They spoke to Wendy's lawyer, they spoke to our lawyer, nothing happened. And so then Phil and I, we had never gone out at the beginning, like many families of murdered uh, children or adult children even, you know, at the beginning, we, we decided let's use the media. Uh, as you know, we're very privileged with the media and we really uh, have a lot of positive uh, experiences and we were always followed by the media, but we didn't go public as I call it, but we did. And so we went on uh, Dateline and then we went on 2020. We went on Inside Edition. There was another pot, uh, a famous podcast by Wondery. And we took every opportunity to give the situation a voice, but nothing happened. And then all my friends, now remember, I'm sitting in Toronto and my American friends in New York, our lawyer and others said, Ruth, you have to write a bill, a bill. How am I gonna write a bill from Canada? Anyway, um, the lawyer in New York said, that's gonna be the only a suggestion, the only way to go about it. And then all my other American friends were kind of you know, mentoring me and so on and, and actually saying, you're gonna need lobbyists. Well, I didn't do it right away. And that's a common thing that happens with families when there is something to memorialize or do something for your children. I could only cope initially on the criminal system, you know, the trials. And it took me a while to get to the grandparent legislation. But when I did, it was right after Garcia's trial in Tallahassee. And this is a funny story. I went to the hairdresser and this young woman jumps up and she says, I'm like, I'm a friend of Dan's. You could see it by her age. Uh, let's go for coffee. And then we went out and she says, uh, what can I do for you? And her name is, her name is Karen Halpern Cyphers. So she, when I did the grandparent legislation, which I'm coming to, it's with a community and she's the champion in this community. So she said, what can I do for you? And I just blurted out grandparent alienation. And she said, done. And then in 2020, right away, there was a bill that she had introduced um, by Jeff Brandeis in the Senate. It didn't go through. And in 2021, it did, uh, we did language like bill language. 2022 was the big bonus year. Uh, we had total support from, from the Speaker of the House, Chris Sprouls. We had a 50 uh, unanimous vote in the Senate. And the same thing in the House, we only lost by three, by three votes. So in other words, very highly supported. And it, and it passed, and then Governor DeSantis uh, passed it and signed it, I really should say, in uh, June 24th of 2022. So this is grandparent legislation its formal name is HB 1119. Its informal name is the Markell Act. And we're really, really thrilled with this opportunity. And what it is, it's very specific that in certain circumstances, the visitation of grandparents can occur if there's a deceased spouse. And the other spouse is either involved, either civilly or criminally, if they're findings. And this is when the grandparents can actually go to the court and ask for visitation. So it's a narrow opportunity, but it's a very specific opportunity. And it's major because there was other attempts at grandparents' bills in Florida. They have very restrictive laws. So we were really fortunate. This is amazing. It is amazing. You are amazing. Make sure everyone, uh, I know our viewers want to read that book, The Unveiling, A Mother's Reflection on Murder, Grief, and Trial Life. It's available on Amazon. There's a digital version, an audio version. Download it uh, uh, and, and, and enjoy uh, understanding what Ruth has gone through uh, as well as other victims. Ruth Markell, thank you so much.